Good morning. I'm delighted to be able to welcome everyone to Etobicoke today. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with some of my candidate colleagues, Noel Semple from Etobicoke Centre and Julie Latete from Etobicoke North. Some of my amazing colleagues that have decided to run as candidates for the Ontario Liberal Party under the leadership of Stephen Del Duca. It is now my pleasure to introduce somebody very familiar to all of us. Since March 2020, Stephen has been leading this, uh, our efforts to really focus on some of the priority issues across our province. He's been recruiting a, an amazing group of candidates across the province that reflect the diversity of, this, of Ontario and also ensure that we've got the expertise that we need for his priorities. It really is my pleasure to introduce Stephen, and, and, and please join me in welcoming Stephen Del Duca and our future Premier of Ontario. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Careful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, well, good morning, everyone. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> so excited to be back in Etobicoke. I was just commenting to Noel and to Lee and to Julie. Uh, that I love coming to Etobicoke. I love every riding in this province, and of course I love my own home community of Woodbridge, but this uh, Etobicoke is a place that is a very special place in my heart. This is where I was born, this is where I grew up, and in fact on the drive uh, here this morning from my home when we came off the 427 at Burnhamthorpe, we in fact drove right past Eatonville Public Library, which is where I got my first library card and first fell in love with reading. And so to be back here uh, with uh, Noel, with Lee, and with Julie, and with all of you, for this particular announcement uh, is really, really special to me. And it's special because, of course, we're standing uh, just a few steps away from a public elementary school, uh, a school where one of our special guests, Malcolm, this morning is a student. Uh, Malcolm's right over there. And uh, we had a chance to chat about this. Uh, you know, you've all heard me say this uh, repeatedly. Uh, I am a, a, a father, and that is my most important job. In fact, it's the most important job that I will ever have in my life. A dad, a proud dad to two young girls. Talia, who's in grade nine, and Grace, who's in grade five. And they both attend publicly funded schools in our home community of Woodbridge. And so when I talk about publicly funded education, when I talk about how difficult the past four years have been, in particular the past two under the Ford Conservatives, it's not a key message for me. It's not a talking point. It's not an abstract conversation. It is literally what my wife and I and our daughters and millions of Ontario families have had to endure when they shouldn't have to. We see, and again, in this election campaign that will officially begin today, it is very clear that this is a campaign about choices. The kind of choice that's right in front of the people of Ontario, in particular on an issue like publicly funded education. And by the way, we saw the undermining and the underfunding of publicly funded education by Doug Ford and the Conservatives before the pandemic began, you know this. You know that when they decided to go to war with frontline education workers, when they decided to try to cut costs, when they decided to demand, command from on high that there would be mandatory online courses, all of that and more was a clear indication that frankly conservatives just cannot help themselves. That when they're given a chance, their first, their first action, one of their first actions is to go on the attack against publicly funded education. This is what we have seen from that party uh, for so many years. And then the pandemic hit. The pandemic hit and we learned that they weren't ready, that there wasn't a plan. This whipsaw effect back and forth of schools opening and closing announcements made late on a Friday with no advance notice, kids who are isolated, who are trying to learn through a screen, all of it, all of it so brutally difficult on Ontario families, on our kids, on their moms and dads, and on frontline education workers. So let's talk about the choice for just a quick moment. We know that Doug Ford has spent the last couple of years going all around the GTHA and beyond and bragging about how he's determined to build Highway 413. Let me talk for just a moment about Highway 413. As a former Minister of Transportation, the minister who stopped that reckless and unnecessary highway the first time, I can tell you that spending north of $10 billion and taking far more than 10 years to build a highway 
that will only save a small handful of commuters mere seconds on their trip, according to the independent analysis done. To do that and to pave over the greenbelt and to destroy wetlands and farmland and to not give people living in this region or across Ontario any real relief when our publicly funded education system is in desperate need of investments in building new schools and repairing existing schools is appalling and unconscionable to me. And from my perspective as a dad with kids in the system, the fact that Doug Ford wants to invest that $10 billion on the 413 instead of making sure that our kids attend state-of-the-art schools really underscores how, frankly, he is not up to the job. He doesn't have the capacity to lead this province, and he frankly does not understand that building up publicly funded education is one of the core responsibilities for an Ontario Premier. And so today I'm here to announce in Etobicoke, I'm here to announce that Ontario Liberals, if elected June 2nd, will once and for all kill Highway 13. It will be gone. It will be gone so that, yes, we protect our wetlands and our farmland and preserve our green belt, but it will be gone and in instead, we will take those $10 billion, your money, your money and mine, and invest it in building 200 new schools across Ontario and repairing 4,500 other schools. And I want to put this in perspective, because, you know, I know it's easy to say we're going to build new schools and repair, and repair existing schools, but I just want you to know, in all of my travels and touring over the past couple of years in particular during this pandemic, I've spoken with teachers, I've spoken with moms and dads, I've even spoken with students like Malcolm and Madeline. And I've heard the stories about schools in this province of ours where the windows in the classrooms don't open and close properly, where the ventilation systems are so outdated that it's embarrassing, where in sweltering heat there is no relief, when in bitter cold there is no relief. And we saw a study that came out a few months ago suggesting that somewhere around one-third of Ontario schools have unsafe lead levels in their drinking water. This is unconscionable. And so in this election campaign, while the Ford Conservatives will continue to talk about a reckless and unnecessary $10 billion highway that will not help a single, a single student do better, will not help our public education system thrive, Ontario Liberals reject that and the choice is to go forward to build 200 new schools, to repair existing schools, 4,500, to make sure that Malcolm and Madeline and Talia and Grace and students right across this province are in classrooms that are modern, safe, clean, so they're set up for success, and so the frontline education workers can also excel. This is as clear a choice as you can find in this election campaign. Backwards with recklessness from the Ford Conservatives and forward in favor of public education that's second to none from the new Ontario Liberal team. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you so much, Stephen, for your leadership on this issue. Um, as a parent here at Wedgwood, Malcolm, why don't you come up here? Um, Malcolm uh, is my son, and I, I pick him up here every day, just about. And uh, I can say that uh, while the teachers and staff do a fabulous job here, we can urgently use this historic investment, which Stephen Del Duca has promised today, and we can urgently use the leadership and the vision which Stephen Del Duca will bring as Premier of Ontario. So thanks again, Stephen, and uh, great to have you here. Thanks, Noel. Thanks, Malcolm. <laughs> Happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, everyone. We'll be taking questions from the floor first, and then we'll be moving to all those online. Stephen. Morning. Um, Recently, uh, an Ontario uh, Catholic school had uh, students create uh, anti-abortion posters for a contest. Um, given the timeliness of this topic, I was just wondering if this is something that you're uh, committed to upholding public funding for, for Catholic schools. Uh, yeah, look, I think this is not the right time for us to have a discussion about how we can further or undermine or disrupt publicly funded education in the system. I think this is a time to reinvest, to invest more. That's why today I'm highlighting that Ontario Liberals over the next five years would invest an additional $10 billion in schools, in our public schools, including the one, ones like the one that we're standing in front of. Uh, I think that uh, it is so important to build up the schools and to strengthen uh, all four of the school boards that we have in this province in the publicly funded system. Uh, I think that's really important. But I will also say 
I think it's important, especially given what we see south of the border, uh, for us to remember that the rights, in particular the reproductive rights of women in society, uh, cannot be taken for granted. That leaders at all levels need to be vigilant. Uh, we need to stand up and call out uh, any retrenchment of those, of those rights at any point in time. And that's why for me, as a father of two young daughters, it is deeply disturbing uh, and frankly scary to see what's happening potentially south of the border. Um, having said that, you can count on me and the Ontario Liberal team, if elected, uh, to invest in publicly funded education every step of the way. Do you have any plans to uh, increase uh, or safeguard abortion access in Ontario more than it is now? Yeah, so a number of weeks ago when I released the Ontario Liberal Plan for Equal Pay and Equal Opportunity for Women, uh, that plan included elements that highlighted the need for a women's health strategy. Uh, it also confirmed that we would protect and enhance uh, access to safe abortions. And again, I just want to make the overarching comment. Uh, these are rights that cannot be taken for granted. They are frail. Uh, there are always those in society who are prepared to try to move us backwards in this regard. Ontario Liberals will not stand for that. And again, I say this not simply as a politician, but as the father of two young daughters. Their rights need to be preserved, in particular their reproductive rights. And what we see happening south of the border is something that uh, cannot go unchallenged. Morning. Liam Casey with the Canadian Press. Um, I believe the school repair backlog under uh, the previous Liberal regime uh, actually repair backlog grew. Um, how are you going to do things differently to make sure that that uh, you know, doesn't happen again? Yeah, it's a great question. So first, let me talk about my own personal record as the former MPP and hopefully the future MPP for Vaughan. In my six years as the MPP, I was very proud to have brought the investments to my home community for six new schools in the span of six years. Uh, now Vaughan, of course, like many other communities, is fast growing. Uh, but we also know in existing neighborhoods, like where we are in Etobicoke Center right now, there are schools like Wedgwood that have been here for quite some time that need reinvestment, that need support. Uh, this is why I, I focus so much on the very clear choice that exists before the people of Ontario. Doug Ford is off talking about a highway a highway that will only save a small handful of commuters, hundreds of commuters, potentially, in 10, 12 plus years, mere seconds on their daily commute. We can't afford to wait that long for real relief in publicly funded education. That's why I made this commitment quite some time ago, and I'm repeating it here this morning. Over five years, Ontario Liberals will cancel that highway, and we will invest $10 billion to make sure that windows can open and close in a school like Wedgwood, to make sure that they don't have as many portables out there. I remember what it was like to go through school in portables. It's not a lot of fun, especially when it's bitterly cold, especially when it's really hot. I want safe drinking water for Malcolm and Madeline and my kids as well. This is what we will focus on because Ontario Liberals understand publicly funded education is one of the core responsibilities of a Premier. Doug Ford doesn't get it and he'll never get it. And this is not just related to the pandemic <clears throat> or limited to the pandemic because he started to undermine public education before we'd ever heard of COVID-19. This is what conservatives do. They want to take us backwards in public education. They want to undermine it. It can't, it can't happen. We need to build it up and that's what Ontario Liberals will do. On that 10 billion, I don't believe the PCs have actually put out a number yet on the, the highway, but um, will 10 billion be enough to do everything you want to do if you want to change the air conditioning and ventilation systems, buy new windows? So let's remember that the $10 billion over five years is in addition to the $14 billion that's already in the capital plan for public education. When you combine the two, it is a, I would say, more than a once-in-a-generation opportunity to get this right. The commitment that I can make right now is that we, as a government, will build 200 new schools across Ontario, and we will repair what needs to be repaired in 4,500 additional schools. And those on the... 200 new schools, is that 200 net new? Like, or 200. You, so you won't be, will you be closing any? No, we will not be closing schools, it will be 200 new. Okay. You wanna go first? <laughs> Morning, Stephen. Morning, Rob. I'm gonna change gears a little bit to transit. There's a lot of concern that your uh, buck -a ride province-wide plan is um, low-balled. The estimate for the cost of it is low-balled. And um, I also, I wanna know about that, like, if apparently, like, two to three times lower than it should be, especially if people flock to the GO trains in Burlington and Hamilton and whatnot. And, and what are you going to do if if people, so many people go to catch the GO train because gas is, you know, $2 a, a liter? It's, go, it's going in the wrong direction, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
how are you going to fit all these people on go trains? Like, I mean, <laughs> regular go train customers could get to the go train and find out that they can't get onto the go train because all these other folks want to take get on it for a dollar. So look, I, first of all, uh, I would say that I'm I'm very as a former transportation minister, I'm comfortable with the modeling. Uh, that uh, does, in fact, uh, make it clear that $710 million in year one and $1.1 billion in year two would be sufficient to make sure that we were making the right kind of investment to deliver Buck a Ride province wide. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, both of my political opponents, uh, the Ford Conservatives and the Horvath NDP, have made the decision to, uh, to do their level of best to criticize and attack this plan, as opposed to acknowledging that, you know, one of their opponents has a good idea, especially as you pointed out, Rob, that. We see gas prices that are spiraling upwards, skyrocketing upwards, uh, life becoming so much less affordable for Ontarians. You know, if I was to take the TTC from this neighborhood right here as an adult, and every single month I was buying a Metro Pass, you know, the Metro Pass for an adult is about $150, $155 per month. Our plan will take that monthly pass down to $40. That's over $1,300 in savings for the year for somebody who lives here in Etobicoke Centre. And that's true for across Toronto. If you live in the suburbs, the outer suburbs, and take the GO train, we're talking about, in some cases, $300 per month in real savings until January 2024. Uh, look, if, if more people flock to transit than is currently the case, I will be the first person as Premier to celebrate that outcome. To celebrate that outcome. And why? Because it's better for all of us. Our projections are that 400,000 cars will be taken off the roads with Buck a Ride province-wide. If that ends up being 600,000 or 700,000 cars, my, good, my goodness, we'll have a party. We'll have a party because that's better for the environment. It's better for our quality of life. And I am determined as Premier, especially with my background in transportation, to make sure that this commitment is properly funded all the way through. All right, so uh, does your plan build in extra trains and might all those six or 700,000 people having a party be doing it on a platform? They've <laughs> they've been left behind on. That's, that's yeah, so our, our plan does call, and you will see this one over the next uh, several days as we release our platform. We call for the continued expansion of public transit in this, uh, not just in this region, but right across Ontario. You might recall, as Minister of Transportation, I was the one who made the first announcements and led the charge on expanding the massive expansion of GO Transit right across this region. We called it Regional Express Rail. It has continued along over the last couple of years, or few years. We will continue to advance that, so we have from, from what I recall, uh, the original plan that we had would see the number of trains on a weekly basis going from 1,500 to 6,000 uh, when uh, Regional Express Rail was fully built out while we electrified. Uh, that's progress, but we need to do more. So Ontario Liberals, if elected, will make your daily commute much cheaper, hundreds of dollars per month cheaper until January 2024 while we continue to build the transit this, re this region desperately needs. One more. How many daily GO trains would there be then you know, under your plan? So, uh, you know, you'll see in our platform, more de uh, in our election platform, not our transit platform, in our election platform, you'll see more details about uh, what that looks like. But we do make an ongoing commitment, and, and I can say this here clearly, the, the work that started back in 2015 to massively expand GO Transit across the greater Toronto and Hamilton area will continue under an Ontario Liberal government. from Le Devoir. Morning. Um, this running was held by the Liberals for about almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, what happened in the last election here and what will you do differently in this election to, to gain the seat? Yeah, no, so listen, is, I think the most exciting thing about the work that we are doing as this campaign officially gets underway is that we are a party that has new leadership and a brand new Liberal team with extraordinarily compelling ideas that speak right to the interests of the people who live here in Etobicoke and the people who live across Ontario. So think about this for a quick second. We're in the midst of an affordability crisis. Four years of the Ford Conservatives, the price of virtually everything has gone up. It's gone in the wrong direction. And there's no real plan for Doug, from Doug Ford to make your transit commute cheaper or to make your food purchases cheaper. So we're addressing that with Buck a Ride province-wide and knocking 8% off prepared foods under $20. Uh, there's nothing in Doug Ford's plan that's gonna protect my parents the parents and grandparents in Ontario from for-profit long-term care or deliver real home care for those seniors who frankly have earned the opportunity to have dignity as they retire and live out their golden years. Our plan does. We will accomplish both. 
Just yesterday, I announced our climate and environment plan. 800 million new trees planted in this province over the next eight years. Five new provincial parks, 50% below 2005 GHG emissions levels by 2030. Net zero by 2050, a $3,000 grant for 100,000 people across this province to retro retrofit their homes to make them more energy efficient. This is simply my way of saying, Ontario Liberals have a plan. Last Thursday, we saw a budget from the Ford Conservatives, a budget with no plan. Several days ago, we saw the NDP release a platform with no numbers. Talk about a stark choice. A budget with no plan, a platform with no numbers. Ontario Liberals here in Etobicoke and across this province have over the last number of months announced more new ideas with costing and numbers attached than either of the other two main parties. That's responsible. That's thoughtfulness. That's competence. That's what the people of Etobicoke Centre want to see. People want to see that right across Etobicoke and they want to see it across Ontario. Um, unrelated question, I'll take the opportunity since you have a francophone candidate behind you. Um, or will you be releasing any plan on francophone affairs uh, yes. In your, your platform in general? Yes, we will. Stay tuned. Coming out over the next several days. All right. Any questions on the line? Uh, go ahead, Will. Just a reminder to reporters on the line, if you could just raise your hand using the Zoom function, I will add you to the queue. And the first question is Richard Southern from City News. Go ahead, Richard. <clears throat> Stephen, good morning. morning uh, as we take uh, our, our first uh, early uh, glimpse at the polls here on campaign day one, it looks like uh, there may be a bit of an issue for, for you in that the progressive vote is kind of split on the left. I'm wondering <laughs> what you think of that and how you plan to, to, to win with, with that scenario. Oh, so. uh, look, Richard, I think, I think you've probably heard me say this before. I'm pretty sure if you talk to your neighbors and friends, you know, people who are not actively engaged in politics the way that we are, uh, if you talk to them, they don't, they don't look at things like polls. They don't sit around the dining room table and uh, talk about these wonderful concepts that people will throw out there from time to time, like strategic voting and all this other. They don't. What they want to know is which leader and which team has a plan that's going to help their family. They want to know which leader and which team is actually going to make their life more affordable. They want to know which leader and team is going to have a plan to make our environment stronger and healthier and better protected and, you know, deliver on for example, ending for-profit long-term care so their parents and grandparents can be safe and have dignity. <clears throat> I think real everyday people just want to know that they can count on a leader and a team to deliver for them. And so this election campaign to me is about the ideas, of course, that we are bringing forward and the other parties are bringing forward. And this is why I talk so often about the very stark choice. Just look at today's announcement from me. Such a clear, a crystal clear choice the Ford Conservatives, who are determined to build a $10 billion highway, it's not really going to help very many commuters or save very much time for those few, few commuters. And Ontario Liberals, who will instead invest that same money, $10 billion, in repairing existing schools and building 200 schools across this province. The choice is clear. The choice is yours, but the choice is clear. So we're going to continue to focus on making sure that Ontario is a place to grow, uh, and the other parties will do what they will do, and the pollsters will do what they do. But you know this, and you've heard people like me say this repeatedly, the only poll that matters is the poll that is coming up on June 2nd. And I'm looking forward to the ongoing conversation we'll continue to have with Ontarians. Stephen, on another note, I'm wondering if, if you uh, do become Premier on June 2nd, will, will you commit to restoring Toronto City Council to its original size? Look, you're talking to someone who was, uh, who was at one point in time in 2018 seeking municipal office in a different municipality and also had his election cancelled I'll say kind of midway through. So I speak with personal experience about how appalling it was for Doug Ford and the Ford Conservatives to interfere in an ongoing election in a democracy like ours. Uh, but I'm also a really big believer in local decision making. And so I would want to work with Toronto City Council and frankly municipalities across Ontario to make sure that they believe that they can guide their own future, that they can achieve what they want to achieve which makes the most sense for them. Instead of making unilateral decisions from Queen's Park, that's, that's the way Doug Ford likes to govern. Threatening to use the notwithstanding clause to trample on people's charter rights, by the way, then using it later on on a different matter. You know, command and control from on high, that's not, that's not the Ontario way. We build from the ground up, we listen to people in their communities, and we work in partnership and collaboration with municipalities to achieve the outcomes that we need to achieve for Ontarians. Okay, the next question is John Michael McGrath from TVO. John, you might 
you on mute. <laughs> might be on mute. Okay, I think John might be having some technical issues. Um, so just a reminder to reporters in the line, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Sorry, can you hear me? There we yes. Go. My apologies. No problem. Um, uh, I was trying to say, uh, you know, about the uh, Catholic School Board anti-abortion issue, um, this has been a perennial issue with Catholic school boards, and governments have... I think treated the uh, issue with kid gloves, frankly, but there's obviously a lot more attention at the moment being placed on uh, abortion rights because of the decision down south or the, the draft decision. Uh, I, I mean, don't you owe Ontario women voters who you are courting over this issue with messages released from your party just yesterday, uh, do you owe them something more than um, the, the statement that, well, it's, it would be too disruptive to... Uh, uh, to, to, to fix issues with the Catholic school board. Well, no, and to be clear, John, uh, John Michael, what, what I said was, you know, in response to a question specifically about eliminating public funding for Catholic schools, I don't think it's disruptive for a premier in this province to use a podium like this one, to use the voice of a premier, to make crystal clear statements to everybody in Ontario, including the Catholic school boards across this province, that certain behaviors are not acceptable in a province like ours. That's why in our liberal plan for, uh, for equal pay and equal opportunity for women. We were, again, crystal clear about protecting and enhancing uh, women's rights, women's reproductive rights in particular. I, I, I couldn't be any more clear about this. And this is too, whether we're t true whether we're talking about women's reproductive rights or we're talking about 2S, 2S LGBTQ plus Ontarians. It's true right across the board. And I, you know, and I think one of the things that's been troubling for me watching over the last four years is the way that Doug Ford has misused or, or not always used his podium, his voice, his premier, the way that a premier should in this province. So you will see me do that. You're seeing me do that here today. And you will see me do that as premier of this province. I, I am very clear on this. And, I, you know, I think it's, it is, uh, it is, again, it's been a very underused uh, tool uh, over the last four years from Doug Ford about how premiers can make their voices heard on issues that matter. And this one matters a lot. The legislature uh, has used its power to, uh, you know, dictate conduct to Catholic school boards uh, on issues like gay straight yeah. alliances yeah. before. I mean, would a liberal government uh, make it clear to Catholic school boards that this kind of behavior of compelling students, coercing students into taking part in these activities is no longer acceptable? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and there are no further questions on the line. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.